Good morning, Avenue Church. How are you? It's a great privilege for me to be here uh, today, especially uh, because of your pastor, uh, Steve, who's is a good friend of mine and uh, who I admire. Uh, I hope you know it. I'm sure you do, but you all have it really good um, here. Pastor Steve's a man of God. Um, he cares for his family. Um, he cares for Jesus, and he cares for you and talks about you all often um, in, in love and uh, really enjoys pastoring this church. So uh, you all ought to know that he's, he's a good one, and we're praying uh, for him and for Andrea and the, um, and the family as, as uh, she recovers as well. Uh, well, you all know this now, but my name is uh, Paulo, and um, uh, I get to serve with World Methodist Evangelism. We uh, identify, connect, uh, train, and support uh, leaders in the Wesleyan Methodist movement around the world uh, in the area of mission and evangelism. Uh, and so uh, Steve was... Uh, is, he's two times alumni with us uh, in that he was a part of the Order of the Flame, which is a gathering of pastors, a community of pastors that participate in some programming with us. And then uh, Flame 2.0, which is a cohort of pastors that he was a part of. And we got to go to, to Cuba together um, and spend some time online together, and it was, it was a good time. Uh, but it is my great honor to be with you today, and I can't wait to share a little bit from God's word with you. Is that okay? All right. Now, we're going to go a little, we have like some of the scripture up, but not all of it. And we're going to go a little old school. So I'll do you a favor and I'll read the first one on my own. And then we have three other passages that I'm going to ask you to open up with me. Is that okay? And it's only in Matthew and in Acts. So you can go ahead and get ready for it, okay? Let me go ahead and open mine. But first, I'm going to take you to. Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, chapter 7, verse 9, and it says this, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Uh, the, the title of the message today is A Consequential Faith. Can you say that to your neighbor? A Consequential Faith. And we're going to keep repeating that throughout this message. Uh, but before we get into it, I wanted to share a quick story uh, with you about a trip that I was on a few years uh, ago. How many of you have like a bucket list of places you'd like to go uh, to in, in, your, in your life? I, I've had a list of places. Um, my wife and I are, are from Brazil. We've moved to the U.S. We've been to a few uh, other places, and I'll tell you what, I had, had this like top 10 places where I'm like, I must, I must go to these places, and for some reason, uh, the Holy Land was not in that list. I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't, there's nothing wrong with the Holy Land, it just wasn't in my list. For some reason, I just didn't think of it that way, and it didn't make the top 10. So one day, my dad calls me, uh, and as we're talking, he shares about the story of how he uh, had taken a group. My, my mom and dad live in Brazil. My dad serves as a, or served, he just retired last year, uh, served as a bishop uh, in the Methodist church in Brazil for, for 25 years and took a few groups uh, to the Holy Land. So he'd taken this group, and this time they had hiked up Mount Sinai. And he thought it was an amazing experience, and he wanted to share that with me. And he said, man, I have a dream. Uh, I, I want to take you and I want to take your brother to hike Mount Sinai with me one day. Now, you know what happened to that top ten list? If, if you love your dad, you know what happened to that top ten list. Suddenly, there was a new number one spot, and that was going to the Holy Land because my dad wanted me to go to the Holy Land, and now it became a dream for me as well. And so, in 2018, we got to go, and it's... 
uh, if, you, if you ever have the opportunity, you should do it. It's a wonderful experience just visiting uh, the Holy Land. But we, the Mount Sinai thing is a little different in that we actually cross into Egypt. And we go over to, to the region of Sinai, and then we go to Mount Sinai. And you have to arrive there at around 12.30 a.m. so you can get set and start the hike at 1 a.m. so that you can get to the peak when the sun is rising. And you want to do that for a couple of reasons. One is because, I mean, it's the sun rising on the peak of Mount Sinai, which is pretty cool. The other reason is because it's the desert, and you don't want to start hiking at noon, right? You don't want to be climbing a mountain at at, at noon. And so it took us about four to five hours uh, to get up there. It was very, very dark in the beginning. We couldn't see. We could just see like maybe the one step or two in front of us. And uh, we would have to call out each other's names to make sure people were still behind us, you know, in a, in a line kind of going, uh, going up. But we finally get to the peak of Mount Sinai. And I look around and it's desert, but it's not desert as in like sand desert. It's desert as in rock, um, rock and dirt uh, desert. And so it's, it's less beige and more brown. And you would look 360 degrees and the sun is coming up and it's just mountain after mountain after mountain. And it's just a beautiful scene. And I was kind of overcome by three, I was overcome by a lot of feelings, but I, I was able to make sense of three of them. The first thing that I felt really strongly was this sense of how small I am. Have you ever had that feeling that you're just very, very, very tiny? And for many reasons, I mean, I look around at just the expanse and I'm like, oh gosh, I'm tiny. But then I also thought of Moses, who had been in that same spot thousands of years ago. And the only reason I'm there is because he was there. There's no other reason to go to that particular mount if it hadn't been for Moses going there. For a thousand. It's only meaning to me is because of our faith. And yet, it was like almost 4,000 years ago. That's a long time. Would you agree? 4,000 years. It's a long time. And so, and so I felt small because... If it weren't for the faithfulness of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, if it weren't for the faithfulness of, of Moses, and then the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations after them, I wouldn't know the Lord. And I'm, I've come, and I'm going to go, and it's going to continue. I'm just really small. Wouldn't you agree? I am the consequence of thousands of years of faithfulness of people who have followed God. Isn't that an amazing thought? But then I also felt gratitude because I looked next to me and my dad and my mom were there. And I remember thinking, I owe my life to these two people, not only because they conceived me, but because but because they, they were faithful to Jesus, and they taught me in this way that I now follow. And if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be here either. But then, if I'm grateful for them, I also need to be grateful for my grandparents. Because they became Christians, because my grandparents taught them in, in the ways of, of, of Jesus. Which is amazing. I was grateful now for, for my grandparents and for many others that were witnesses in, in their lives for my parents. But if I'm grateful for my grandparents, I also need to be grateful. I'm going to go to my dad's side of the family, to this, to this uh, Assemblies of God missionary sometime in the 50s <laughs> who's walking around nowhere in Brazil and bumps into this couple that was uh, illiterate, uneducated, and he shares the gospel with them. And those were my grandparents. And if it weren't for the faithfulness of that missionary, I wouldn't be there either. 
So I felt just a sense of gratitude for people that have come before me. But then I had this other feeling. This one was a scary one. I had this burden over me because I'm the consequence of Moses, but I'm also the consequence of my parents and my grandparents and that faithful missionary. Who is it that can claim years from now that they are a consequence of my life and what I decided to do? And so I became burdened by that because, because, friends, our faith is, is anything but inconsequential. Your faith and my faith has real consequence. And yet we sometimes live our lives and our faith as if there were no real consequence to it. And so what I want to do with you today is I want to lead you through three uh, encounters that Jesus has with his disciples that were consequential encounters for the disciples that changed changed the direction of their lives, it was consequential for them, but I also believe will be consequential encounters for you and me. Amen? So, are you all ready with the Bibles? You can scroll them too. Uh, scroll, read the one in front of you, read the one that you brought from home. Um, and so it may, may read a little different than what I have, but you can follow. And I want you to follow because I'm going to ask some questions throughout this, okay? Uh, so the first encounter we find in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Now, y'all had a heads up because I told you we were going to go to Matthew and then to Acts. Um, and so you were able to kind of prepare. So if you found it, say amen. If you didn't find it, say mercy. All right. And here's what it says. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Okay, now, Jesus is starting here, he's... Jesus is in the process of calling his disciples. Um, we know that uh, eventually he ends up with the 12 apostles, not just 12 disciples. There were many other disciples, but there were 12 that kind of shared life with Jesus, were with him everywhere. Um, and, and probably if we were to be really faithful, we more like 15 or 16 because you had uh, the women that were following Jesus but aren't mentioned uh, here in the text, but, but there were more than four. But right now, Jesus is calling the first four disciples, okay? Now, I didn't realize this until uh, uh, just a while ago, but if you go to verse 19 and, and you read it, notice that there are two distinct parts in that short verse. So it says, and he said to them, part one, follow me. And he said to them, Follow me. Now, now, follow me is an invitation. It's not a command. If, if you decide not to follow Jesus, would Jesus run after you and get angry at you? Anybody? No. Actually, did you know this? So we agree there were 12 apostles. Did you know there were supposed to be 13? There were supposed to be 13. Somebody said no to Jesus. Can anybody tell me who said no to Jesus? One of you knows. The rich young ruler. Right? The rich young ruler. The Bible tells us this story of the rich young ruler who's a man of many possessions uh, but, was, uh, but feared God. And so the, the, the young man comes to Jesus and begins talking to Jesus. He wants to know uh, how, can, how he can inherit the kingdom of God, how he can inherit eternal life. He he wants to know what he needs to do. Uh, Jesus tells him everything he needs to do. He says, but I do all these things. And then Jesus says, okay, very good. Now go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And what does the Bible tell us? He turned around and left. Why? He felt like he had too much to lose. 
We don't hear about the rich young ruler anymore. You know why? Because Jesus didn't go after him, try to beat him up or something because he didn't follow. You see, there's an option. You and I don't need to follow Jesus. We don't have to. It's an invitation. Okay? Now, now read, let's read the second part. He, and he said to them, follow me now, and I will make you fish for people. In other le- translations, it might say, and I will make you a fisher of people. I will make you fishers of people, right? However, the end of it says, the beginning says, and I will make. And I will make. So the first part of this is an invitation. The second part is what? A consequence. You see, there is consequence to following Jesus. And here we're learning that following Jesus means Jesus will make us fishers of people. Now, a few years ago, I was reading this text, and when I realized this, and it threw me into like this crisis because I began thinking. I'm, I'm a, I tend to be a more like logical, rational kind of person. Um, I, I have to think first and understand first, and, and then I can have emotions about something. You know, I, I'm kind of... Anyways, my wife is the opposite. It's like very emotional, and then she thinks about it. And so it's, it's a really fun relationship. And, um, and, so, and, so, and so I was thinking about this, and, I, and I'm like, this doesn't add up. I'm like, is, am, I, am I becoming the kind of person that attracts others to me? Am I becoming someone who lives a life that is worthy of others following me? Am I eager to share Jesus with other people? And I began wondering, like, if I'm not, if I'm not becoming those things, then there's only two options. Logically, there's only two options. One is that Jesus didn't mean what he said. Maybe Jesus didn't mean what he said. Because he didn't say, come follow me and maybe I will make you fishers of people. He didn't say, come follow me and I'm going to try really hard to make you fishers of people. He, he also didn't say, come follow me and uh, I'm going to take you through a five-step process and you follow all five steps, I'm going to make you fishers of people. He didn't do that. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. I will make you fishers of people. So the one option is, Jesus wasn't serious. Or Jesus was a liar. Isn't that an option? It's an option if, if I choose not to, not to believe in Jesus. But if I, if I choose to believe in Jesus' words in Scripture, then the other option has to be true. And the other option hurts. You want to hear it? If I'm not becoming somebody who's fishing for people, then maybe I haven't really said yes to following Jesus. It's the only other option. Are you with me? It's the only other option. And so I kind of threw myself, I was close to my bed in prayer, and I was like, God, I'm sorry, I can't believe this. I don't don't know that I follow you. I don't know that I'm actually following you. Please forgive me, please. And and I'm like, I want to renew this because I don't, I don't want to fathom the idea that I'm living my life thinking that I've said yes to following Jesus but not living out the consequence of following Jesus. It's Jesus' promise. If we follow Jesus, he will make us fishers of people. Amen? So follow me is an invitation. I will make you fishers of people is a consequence. And how many disciples are there? Four. He's he's inviting the first four disciples. We're going to get to 12 soon, okay? We're going to get to 12. Actually, we're going to get to 11, but that's a whole other story. So we have have four disciples here. Okay. All right. We're going to go to our second encounter. You ready? All right. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. All 
All right, if you found it, say amen. If you didn't find it, say, I need to go to Sunday school. <laughs> oh, boy. Sunday school, huh? All right. So ready, starting in verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen? Okay. Now, how many disciples are here? Eleven. It's tragically, eleven. We know yeah, Judas. Judas betrays Jesus. Actually, actually, you know this. Every single disciple betrays Jesus at some point. Um, they just hung, hung in there long enough for Jesus to meet them again. Judas didn't. Uh, so we have 11 disciples here. Okay? And, and there's, a, again, a promise, a, an invitation. There's, again, an invitation from Jesus. And there's, again, a consequence to our response to that invitation. Can you see it? All right. Here's the invitation. Verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You can, if you would like, not make disciples. You can, be, you can never be involved in make, making disciples in your life. That's okay. You can do that. You can come to church Sunday after Sunday. You can sit in the pew. You can, you can tithe. You can give offerings. You can participate in small groups. You can participate in Sunday school. You can, uh, you can serve in many ways. You can be a part of mission trips. Um, you, can, um, uh, you can help out uh, with youth ministry if you'd like. You can do all those things. And never be actually involved in making disciples. And you can live your life, and that's okay. But you're missing out on something. I'm going to show you what you're missing out on here in a second, which is the consequence of going to make disciples. You see, you see, I believe we serve a God that is a God in movement. Have you ever thought that God is not a static God, but a moving God? So the Bible, the Bible wants us to know this so bad that it includes God on the move in the very first two verses of the entire scripture. Because if you go all the way back to Genesis, you'll read that the Spirit of God did what? Flew or hovered or whatever other word you want to use over kind of the nothingness of creation. And it wasn't until the Spirit of God moved over it that God started to speak things into existence. Our God is a God that moves. Okay? Now, you and I are also on the move. Would you agree? Okay? So some of us have had to move from one house to another. Some of us have moved from one job to another. Some of us uh, have had children. And then some of us, uh, those children have grown up and had more children and now we're grandparents. And uh, some of us have moved to the Milford area in recent years. Uh, uh, some of us uh, were here, and then we left, and then we came back. Um, some of us have new projects and new dreams and new trips to go on and new things to do. But whatever, whatever uh, it might be, you and I are on the move, yes? Your life today for sure is not just like it was five years ago. COVID, anybody? It's crazy, right? But our lives are not the same today that they were five years ago. So you and I are on the move. So we've established that God's on the move. We've established that we're on the move. Yeah? Okay. Every now and then, though, every now and then, where we are going and where God is going happen to collide. And that's what we would call an encounter with God. 
Maybe it's a church service that you were a part of and the message stirred you up and you felt like you had encountered the living God. Maybe it was a retreat you were on. Maybe it was a mission trip that you were on. Maybe it was a small group meeting or maybe you were by yourself hiking and God met you there somehow. But if you're here today, chances are good that at some point in your life or in many points in your life, you've had an encounter or encounters with God. The, it's a beautiful thing. So I, don't, I, don't, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to beat on this, but, but I want you to think past the encounter. At every encounter we have with God, what we tend to do is miss that the encounter is not the point. But rather, what happens after the encounter. Because, see, we are, we, we're all going all about our lives, and God is on a mission. And when we meet with God, there is an invitation. Will you stop what you're doing? Will you interrupt the direction that you're going in? And will you start moving where I'm moving? Because, you know what? God, we believe this, God is an omnipresent God, yes? Which means that God is everywhere at all times. So God is here today, yes? I hope so. Uh, but when you go to lunch after this, is God going to be there? At home, God's going to be there, yeah? At work, God's going to be there. In the midst of tragedy and suffering, is God going to be there? Right? In hospital beds and in other countries, even the ones we don't like, is God there? Yes. The presence of God is certain everywhere at all times. But catch this. The manifestation of the presence of God, which is a little different because it's the stuff that we see and that we hear and that we feel, the miracles happening and supernatural things, that is not everywhere at every time. And there's a condition for the manifest presence of God. You want to see it? Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. And then it says, if you're reading NIV, it'll say, and remember I am with you. But this is one of the few times any of you, for sure there's at least one, any of you like reading the King James Version? It's like if you like Shakespeare, you like the King James Version, right? King James Version. If you read the King James Version, there's a better word. The remember is not a good one. Remember is not a good translation. It says, and lo, I am with you. Go therefore and make disciples, and lo, I will be with you. What God is saying, if you go where I'm going, which is in the midst of trying to reconcile the world to myself, that people would know who I am and that would relate to me. If you go there with me, I will be with you. This I will be with you is not a generic presence. It's not the omnipresence of God. It is the manifest presence of God in our lives. So, so the problem is we live our lives knowing that God is here and God is there and God is everywhere, but we don't get to experience the manifest presence of God because we don't go where God is going. Because you see, it says, if you go, then, lo. Help me out here. If we go, then, lo. But if no go, then, no lo. Right? Think about it. If we don't go where God is going, that's fine. But we don't get to experience daily, hourly, weekly, monthly, the manifest presence of God. I mean, think about it. The disciples who followed Jesus every day and went where Jesus was going got to see what? They got to see the blind receive their sight. They got to see the lame go back to walking. They got to see relationships restored. They got to see the dead come from death into life. Just imagine just imagine telling those stories to your kids and to your grandkids. Isn't that amazing? But we don't get to see that unless we go where God is going. Amen? So, 
the invitation, our first invitation is to follow Jesus and that he will make us fishers of people. The invitation here is go and make disciples and lo, I will be with you. The invitation is go. The consequence is lo. Okay? Now we're going to our third encounter. Oh, and by the way, 11 disciples. We had four disciples, now we have 11 disciples. Now we are in Acts. We are in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 4 and 5, and then we're going to skip to verse 8, okay? Verses 4 and 5, and then verse 8. Acts chapter 1. If you found it, say hallelujah. hallelujah. If you haven't found it yet, say, Pastor, pray for me. <laughs> okay, you guys ready? All right, here's, here's what it says. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. But you will receive, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amen. All right. Trick question for you all. How many disciples are here? The window doesn't really have the right count, by the way. Though I really like the image of Jesus flying. Isn't that cool? Have you ever thought of that? Jesus flew? Isn't that? Anyways, maybe it's just me. I'm a nerd. Whatever. Um, <laughs> how many disciples are there? You got to search for, what's that? A hundred, who said 120? Ah, such a geek. Okay. 110. You actually have to go to verse 15 to see the 120, okay? So there are 120 disciples at, at that point. So we had four, then we had 11, now we have 120. Uh, and what is the invitation from Jesus? Jesus says, wait for the promise of the Father. Don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father. What's the promise of the Father? The Holy Spirit. Wait for the promise of the Father. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's the invitation. What's the consequence? This is the most obvious one. And you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses. Jesus says you will, then you probably will, okay? And so, listen, remember we were talking about the manifest presence of God and the fact that the disciples who followed uh, Jesus were able to go where Jesus was going because they went where Jesus uh, went. They got to witness the power of God in motion at every place they went, and we have the Gospels to tell us all of those stories, and you might say, Paulo, we don't have Jesus walking with us right now, so how do we know? And I'd say, and I'd say, remember in John where Jesus talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, sent, he's, he says, the Father will send you the Holy Spirit, and you will do greater things than I. Do you remember that? Jesus says that. You will do greater things than I. What he's saying is that, that Jesus is leaving, but that we're receiving his spirit. And if we ask and if we receive the Holy Spirit, by the way, you're not going like, to get like invaded by the Holy Spirit somehow if you don't want it. I'm just letting you know. Like this, God, is, God is a gentleman kind of God, right? And God doesn't go where he's not invited. And so, and so the disciples had to actually wait in prayer and in worship 
and in asking for the Holy Spirit to come in order for the Holy Spirit to come and for them to receive power. And when we say they receive power is they are receiving the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the same, listen to this, this is no, this is no small thing. You receive the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And Jesus said that if we go in this way, if we have the Holy Spirit, if we follow Jesus, if we go and make disciples, that we would do greater things than he did. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty big. I mean, did you read the Gospels? Jesus did some pretty crazy things. But I'll tell you what. My family could use a bit of greater things. My relationships, my marriage, my kids, we could use some of that greater things stuff. This city, in Milford and the surrounding areas, I'm sure there are places and situations and, and some really tough spots where we could use some greater things. Don't you agree? I'm sure, I'm sure that in your life, in your job or your career, you could use some greater things. Yes? Uh, in your family, in your relationships, in some of your friendships, you could use some greater things. We need greater things. And Jesus is saying it's available to you. Will you receive it? Will you receive the Holy Spirit so that I can make you filled with power so that you can be my witnesses? Imagine going around witnessing of the power and love of Jesus in a way that people can sense and feel and see and hear. I don't know. If, if, if this is true, I want it. Don't you? So the invitation is wait for the promise of the Father. The consequence is you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. Our faith is consequential. Amen? Now you might be thinking, Paulo, it's a great message. Thank you. Love the encounters. It's good stuff. But you started reading Revelation and that verse doesn't seem to have anything to do with anything else you said. Well, I'm glad that you asked. We're going to go back to Revelation. Chapter 7, verse 9. You don't need to open it. I'm going to read it real quickly here. Where it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. I'm going to repeat this one bit. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. I call foul on this one. I mean, how many were there when Jesus first called disciples? Four, and then there were 11, and then there were... When Jesus multiplied the bread and fish, he fed how many? 5,000. If you go to the... We have an entire book in the Old Testament that is all about numbers and every single number you can I mean talk about people that were great with census I mean they knew every single head that was in that I mean they there were millions of Israelites and they were counted counted every single one of them and 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 John is writing this 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 passage from the island of Patmos where he's a prisoner he's going to die and he has this vision of what's going to happen. And what he's seeing here is a great multitude. He's not talking about, he's not talking about great multitude here. He's talking about in the clash of heaven and earth. As, as, as we now go to be with God, there will be a multitude of people that no one could count from every nation, language, tribe. And I'm thinking there is no way that the God of the universe that the Holy Spirit can't count. Don't you agree? So why is it that we don't have this number? 
We don't have this number. Thank you. Can, can I cheat and copy you? She whispered the answer to me, so now I know it. I believe that somehow, by the grace and mercy of God poured upon us, that this number is not here because it's still being written. You see, you see, this number is the consequence, is the consequence of your faith, of my faith, of people of faith before us and people of faith after us. And there is no way of knowing what the end is going to be because many of us are still making decisions on whether or not we're going to follow Jesus, whether or not we're going to be involved in making disciples, and whether or not we want to receive the Holy Spirit. You see, there are people in your lives, children, men, women, friends, family, uh, uh, work, colleagues, people that you bump into in the coffee shop and in the grocery store that are hungry to receive a message of hope in Jesus. They need you to say yes so that one day they can too be in this multitude that no one can count because God is still counting it. Amen? So I don't know about you, but I'm going to be there. Are you going to be there? I mean, I desperately want to be there. And I think you guys are going to be there too. But when we get there, I don't want it just to be about you and me. I want to have a conversation with you. And we're going to say, let's we'll start the conversation with something like, oh, I remember that day in Milford. Oh, it was great. We had a fun time. Two great services, sang some beautiful songs and I had this message, and, and now we're here. But, and, then, and then you guys are going to start pointing out to people some that you remember and some that came after them that you had no clue of because we don't know the magnitude of the consequence of decisions we make now. We don't know it. There's no way to know. Do you think Moses saw me at Mount Sinai? No. His mind is too small, Right? We're humans. Goodness gracious. We're sometimes, we're just pitiful, aren't we? I'm telling you. There's no way he could see that. But I am indeed a consequence of his faith. Aren't I? And so in heaven, in this multitude, Moses gets to claim me and my children and whoever's a consequence of my faith. And I get to claim everybody that's coming after me, people that I don't even know are going to be alive. That I hope one day will say, there was this guy, Paulo, and he shared about Jesus with my mom or my dad or my grandma or my granddad. And, and I'm here now because he was faithful. God, help me be faithful. I want to. Don't you want to? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy in our lives. God, who would we be without you? God, indeed, we, we don't want anything to do without you. God, you are our life. You are our strength. And God, today we're learning you are our purpose. Because God, following you turns us into people of great consequence. And God, that's what we want to be. God, would you stir up our hearts and our minds and our spirit? God, that we would be drawn to you, to follow you, to be involved in sharing your word with other people, raising up others in the faith. And God, would you send us your Holy Spirit? Come, Holy Spirit. And would you meet us, God? We don't want you just to meet us so we can go home and celebrate it. We want you to meet us so that we can change direction. And God, would you allow us to be a part of that great multitude? Indeed, would you allow us to be a great part of this, uh, a part of this great multitude, not just for ourselves, but for the many, many, many generations that are still to come? God, we want this. So would you renew our intents? Would you renew our desires? And would you encounter us? In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you.